Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm the president of the National Press Club and Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News. I'd like to welcome our club members and guests who are joining us here today, as well as the audience that's watching on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech, and afterwards I will ask as many questions from the audience as time permits. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we can have as much time as possible for questions. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause during the speech, it may be from the guests and members of the general public who attend our luncheons, and not necessarily from the working press. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Paul Marion, Washington Bureau Chief for Crane Communications, Viola Ginger, correspondent for Bloomberg News, Jim Ostroff, Associate Editor at Kiplinger Washington Editors, Esco Hamilo, State Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs, Rick Dunham, Washington Bureau Chief of the Houston Chronicle and a monthly columnist writing about American politics and culture for Amulete, Finland's second largest newspaper. <laughs> His Excellency Pekka Lintu, Ambassador of Finland to the United States. Skipping over the podium, Melissa Charbonneau, the Vice Chair of the National Press Club Speaker Committee and White House Correspondent for CBN News. Skipping over our guests for just one moment, Myron Belkine, re retired from Associate, uh, Associated Press and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's luncheon. Alino Kaku. Director General of the Department of, of the Americas and Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Donna Leinwand, National Reporter for USA Today and the Vice President-Elect of the National Press Club. Keith Hill, Writer-Editor for the Bureau of National Affairs and Vice Chair of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Su Suzanne Straglinski, Washington Correspondent for, uh, for the uh, Deseret Morning News of Salt Lake City and Tom Doggett, who covers energy issues for Reuters. <laughs> if our guest of honor had not made a career change 17 years ago, he might well be in the audience today as a working journalist member of the National Press Club. Instead, he joins us as Prime Minister of Finland. Matti van Hannen was a journalist on a local newspaper in Finland for six years, including three as editor-in-chief, until he was elected to Parliament in 1991. That started a political career that eventually led to his becoming leader of Finland's Centre Party and Prime Minister in 2003. And so, Mr. Prime Minister, we welcome you today both as the head of the government of Finland and as someone who is a distinguished alumnus of the journalism profession. As a politician, our guest today has taken a leading role in energy and climate policies, as well as housing issues. He also has frequently spoken about the challenges and opportunities of globalization and underlined the role of entrepreneurship and hard work. The Prime Minister believes strongly in the importance of innovation, specifically in regard to energy matters, as his country seeks to reduce its dependence on oil imports from Russia. We all know, though, that Finland isn't so dependent on imports when it comes to high technology. In fact, just the opposite is true, which reminds me, now would be a good time for all of you to turn off your Nokia cell phones? <laughs> so that the speech would not be interrupted. And while its cell phones may be ubiquitous, Finland unfortunately cannot export its quality of life. A Reader's Digest study last October ranked Finland as the best country to live in. The study said, and I, and I quote, Finland wins high marks for air and water quality, a low incidence of infant disease, and how well it protects citizens from water pollution and natural disasters. The Prime Minister seeks to follow his own advice to others when it comes to the environment. He lives in a house that he largely built himself, and he likes to walk outdoors, often with people with whom he's discussing the issues of the day. Now today, thankfully, he's decided to bring such a discussion to our podium. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Finland, Matti van Hannen, to the National Press Club. Mr. President, thank you so much, distinguished journalists, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege 
for me to address this audience. It is even more so when I realized that I have been given the honor to be one of the first guest speakers here during the National Press Club's 100th anniversary year. Uh, some weeks ago I saw from Finnish TV there was a black-white document from some decades ago and I suddenly found that our former president uh, Urho Kekkonen was speaking in this just same place and and um, and I thought that I, I thought that it's really a privilege to me to uh, to get to got the invitation to hear and let me also thank very much that I got an uh, apple pie because uh, <laughs> because the trip to U US US is nothing if you don't get at least one so apple pie and <laughs> you give it to me I also know that you are at this moment of time living a very exciting period here in Washington and the United States in general. Therefore, it gives me all the more ple pleasure that so many people have found the time to come and listen to me. But in fact, what I'm going to tell you, my message from Finland, we Finns find a very important one. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, climate change rose very high on the political agenda. This has never before happened for an environmental issue. It is obvious that there is an increasing awareness of the consequences of climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has played a key role. Our current understanding of the problem and the high risks involved leaves no option for any reasonable responsible poli policy makers but to act. It was no accident that uh, the IPCC and former Vice President Al Gore were accorded the Nobel Pr Peace Prize, the threats presented by climate change to the stable development of societies have become more and more visible. There is an imminent threat to the environment. We run the risk of under, under, undermining the future for coming generations. Secondly, competition for vital natural resources, in particular water, may further intensify in many parts of the world as a result of chasing weather patterns. This is likely, likely to lead to increasing local and regional strife. Climate change is also an economic problem. A growing number of leading economists say that climate change itself, not the various actions to mitigate it, threatens the sub substanti sustainable economic growth of nations. The United Nations Climate Conference in Bali in December was, an very, was a very important milestone in the efforts to tackle climate change. Expe expectations were already very high before the conference. The international community stressed the need to act. Political leaders were also very explicit in this respect at the high-level event on climate change organized by the UN Se Secretary General in New York in September. However, countries had, of course, differing views of what would be good or even an acceptable outcome in Bali. And negotiations were not easy. Finland and the European Union are satisfied with the results. We went there to get an agreement on launching a global and comprehensive negotiation process that would lead to a global and comprehensive agreement on a post-2012 climate re regime in 2009. This is ex exactly, exactly what was decided. We now have a roadmap outlining the elements, organizations, and a timetable of such a process. It is our, our understanding that this was also the goal of the United States. And indeed, I'm very happy that the United States decided to join the negotiating process. But you may ask, at this stage, are countries not free to choose their way to develop their economies and their way of life? Can people not choose 
what they wish to do and not to dictate it to by international organizations or bound by all sorts of restrictions. Of course, all, of course, for all people, for all of us, freedom should be the basis of all human action. And I'm, I am conscious of saying this in the land of freedom as laid down in the Constitution of the United States. But freedom always entails responsibility. In exercising our freedom to choose, to lead our lives in the way we want, we cannot tram trample on the freedom of others, not erode the freedom and rights of the generations to come. And this is the cru crux of the problem when we are talking about climate change. The extent of human in induced climate change depends on the sum of human actions. All nations have a responsibility, some bigger, some smaller. Industrialized countries such as the member states of the European Union and the United States have a great historical, historical responsibility for the greenhouse gases already accumulated in the atmosphere. This situation will change as new economies take their rightful place in the global arena. All countries also have responsibility to address the issue. Any investment made in any country is an opportunity. Rapidly developing emerging economies offers especially wide opportunities in this respect. They also have to take into account the threat of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, total energy use of the US and Finland are per capita at the same level. The reasons for this are our climate in Finland, our long distances and our energy intensive in industry. Finland, however, uses even more electricity per capita than the US. Nevertheless, per capita Finland produces less CO2 emissions than the US does. In fact, Finland is fully committed to decrease CO2 emissions in the framework of Kyoto Protocol and as a member state of the European Union. The EU ob objective is to achieve at least a 20% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2020, compared to year 1990. In case a global and comprehensive post-2012 agreement is reached, the objective for the redu reduction of greenhouse gas emissions will rise to 30%. Finland strongly believe believes that working together will benefit us all. Global action makes climate efforts more cost-efficient and effective. We can achieve more with the same investment. Global agreements can also make everybody's contribution visible and thus create the necessary mutual trust. Such a framework can thus avert the fear of some nations related to carbon leakage and competitiveness. It is extremely important that competition in the global market is fair. Therefore, all countries should be committed to decrease CO2 emissions. We cannot afford free riders. And I'm saying that when I'm coming from a country which is producing paper for more than 100 million people, steel for about 50 million people, and our population is only about 5 million people. So we are taking to our statistic, all of these emissions which are <laughs> coming from the producing of this, this paper. And that's why the fair competition is very important. Everyone had to use the same rules. A global approach to addressing climate change is also conducive to more ambitious action. With all its shortcomings, the United Nations is the only institutional arrangement that can provide such a wide framework. The topics of upcoming negotiations as identified in Bali are the right ones. Mitigation, adaption, technology and finance. Obviously the building blocks of future agreement and the details involved are to be negotiated on the basis of the, these topics. 
The EU has already presented its general ideas in this respect. We will come with more specific, specific ideas as the, as the negotiations evolve. We are also happy to exchange views with other countries. The, the key issue is how we will all contribute. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change currently has some 190 parties, representing a wide variety of circumstances, responsibilities and opportunities. It is obvious that the post-2012 regime must respond to this variety in order to be feasible and effective. Contributions expected of countries at different stages of development need to ref reflect their capabilities. For industrialized countries, binding targets are more flexible than often thought. They define the level of effort and outcome, but leave the selection of instruments and policies to reach this outcome to national decision making. Let me in this context touch briefly on one particular sector, deforestation. In my understanding, this is an area of high interest to the US. This is also the case in Finland, and being a highly forested, forested country, we have special know-how in this field. In our view, sustainable forest management in all countries can make a crucial contribution to reducing greenhouse gases. Not only talk the sink effect, but also by provo providing a source for renewable energy and material substitution through harvested wood products. The outcome of the negotiation in Pali is an important step towards a global and comprehensive agreement how to tackle climate change, but it is, not only, a, but it is only a start. The international community will now be engaged in very intensive work. Everybody needs to participate in an active and constructive way. The role of the US is crucial given its economic and political weight and its contribution to the global emissions of greenhouse gases. The importance of your full involvement cannot be overemphasized. Let me also at this point comment your Methane to Markets program as a good example. Within the EU, we welcome the new initiatives of the current administration in this respect. We also appreciate the special challenge posed by the election year. It is of utmost importance that also the coming administration will become an active partner in negotiations as soon as, soon as it has taken office. In the EU, we are proud of the leadership that we have been able to show in the international, regional and national climate policies. But leadership is not a zero-sum game. All nations need to show de determination and leadership in the efforts to tackle climate change. The United States is in a unique position. And we need results for the Copenhagen summit next year, already in the late of next year. It happens far too often that international negotiations tend to go on too long. This time we cannot wait. Ladies and gentlemen, to combat, combat climate change, we need commitment, passion and action. Let me point, point out three important measures how we can decrease CO2 emissions globally. Firstly, policymakers have to de develop new approaches and solutions to promote cleaner and greener technologies. It is of utmost importance to launch specific research and development programs that focus on developing environmental and energy technologies. This is an in investment that will pay back in future. Secondly, especially in the northern part of the world, we can make a difference in the way we build and insulate our buildings and how we heat them. Energy efficiency is taken into account when we design and build new buildings and houses, but we should also find ways and means to encourage people 
to make changes in houses already built. This will open new business opportunities in construction and for companies equipping houses. Thirdly, road traffic is one of the biggest polluters. In the US, road traffic pro produces about 27% of all CO2 emissions. In Finland, about 18%. In this sector, there are huge possibilities to cut emissions by creating technological solutions for engines and developing biofuels. As part of our own climate and energy st strategy, the Finnish government proposed to Parliament that car taxation should be based on carbon dioxide emissions, and Parliament accepted it some, months, some weeks ago. The car tax levied on passenger cars upon registration and the annual vehicle and vehicle tax levied on all registered vehicles depend on the vehicle's carbon dioxide emissions. The tax rate in Finland will vary, vary between 10 and 40 percent of the consumer price. So you realize why I'm uh, not running in this country. <laughs> I believe that this constitutes a clear incentive for consumers to choose cars which use less fuel. It is important to give clear signals also to car manufacturers to develop and produce cars with significantly lower emissions and fuel consumption. Should we succeed, succeed in this, we will be able to pave the way for a substantial reduction of emissions. Ladies and gentlemen, no speech about energy and climate in the European context is complete without discussing the role of Russia. Russia is the most important energy supplier of the European Union. About one quarter of the nat natural gas and one third of oil consumed in the EU comes from, from Russia. On the other hand, the EU is an important source of income for the Russian energy companies. In Russia, energy provides over 50% of budget revenue and over 60% of export income. The importance of the EU is especially clear in the natural gas sector. For Finland, Russia has been a reliable supplier of gas and electricity for years, actually for decades. But, if, but we have noticed that during the coldest winter spells when power consumption is at its highest, Russia has some difficulties to de deliver electricity in accrued quantities. This is not a problem for Finland as we have appropriate fallback systems, but there is a clear lesson for both parties. New generating capacity is needed. Russia is clearly interested in exporting more energy to Europe. The reason is simple. There is a buyer and there is a seller. Europe needs the energy and they need the money. That is what trade is all about. But increased deliveries require new infrastructure. In our neighborhood, a joint venture owned by Gazprom and its German and Dutch partners is planning to build a new major pipeline from Russia across the Baltic Sea to Germany. The Europeans are indeed inter interested in importing even more gas from Russia as the gas demand is rising and as domestic production in the North Sea declines. The main question raised in this context is not whether energy might be used as a political weapon between EU and Russia, but is there enough gas to be exported? The reason for this question is Russia's quick economic growth and rising demand for gas and electricity. At present, more than half of electricity is produced at gas-fired plants. In spite of Russia's ambitious plans to build more nuclear and coal-fired power stations, gas will dominate power generating generation in the coming years, as it will take years before new plant generating capacity is in place. 
Probably the quickest and environmental best way to have more natural gas available for export would be to increase energy efficiency in Russia. The Russian government is taking step, steps in this direction. Domestic prices of natural gas will be increased by 25% each year until 2011. Even though Russia is our number one supply, supplier of natural gas, it is not the only one. In addition to Russia, we have often, and when I'm talking about we, I'm not using Finland, but EU. Um, in addition to Russia, Union have other major suppliers. Gas comes from Norway and North, North, North Africa uh, through several pipelines. And the EU is interested in diversifying its import pipeline network further. Suppliers from the Caspian region and the Middle East are often mentioned. The latter control 40% of world's natural gas reserves. Another possibility for European consumers is LNG, which is presently imported from North and West Africa and the Middle East. When talking about natural gas market, it is clear that imports will grow to compensate the declining domestic production. But how much new demand there will be in addition and as a result of our climate policy is more unclear. Will coal be replaced by gas or will energy efficiency and increased use of renewables provide the solution? We have to remember that natural gas is also fossil fuel and its consumption cannot grow unhindered if we want to take our climate commitments seriously. In any case, we need huge invest investments both in European and Russian energy production and transport. There are already several investments by European companies in the Russian, Russian energy sector as well as Russian investments in European energy market. We hope that these mutually beneficial investments could continue and strengthen the EU-Russia energy and economic ties. Let me try to sum summarize. Uh, European Union will be more and more dependent on imported energy. In consequence, we must improve energy efficiency and develop a feasible energy mix with more renewables. At the same time, alternative import sources and roads must be found, and we will need a strategic partnership with Russia. Mr. President, distinguished journalists, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our ideas with you. And now, without further ado, I am more than willing to move on the real challenging part of the visit, questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a lot of questions, some, uh, quite a few on climate change and some on some other issues as well. Starting with this, if, if there were one policy change that you could make to address the global warming problem, what would that be? In a, in a short period, I, I think that Chasing the uh, vehicle, the car engine technologies and uh, fuels will be will have the m most quickly um, uh, 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 re re results. Uh, if you think about year 2020, we can change um, almost the whole car. Um, cars to new, new, new cars and, uh, and, uh, and this is an area where we can use taxation and also standards to the, to the car manufacturing industry. Although the climate change issue is certainly gaining political steam here in the United States, the biggest political issue of this decade in the United States has probably been the war on terror. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the war on terror in the context of all of this. In the United States, has it proved to be that uh, we focus too much on that and not enough on climate change? 
but e everyone can see that uh, when there is a l less of uh, lack, lack of energy, there will be also competitive who can get the ener energy and uh, and um, how we can how we can uh, st strengthen the energy security and 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 um, it is easy to see that there there will be and there is a link between uh, energy security and uh, with when quite many conflicts which we can see in the in the world so at the same time we had we had to go by hand to hand with hand to hand um, to to strengthen that kind of co cooperation where where uh, we can worldwide uh, give better opportunities also to developing countries to be sure that they can get energy also also in 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 future Has any evidence of global warming, warming been seen so far in Finland? And if so, how serious is it? Even Finland is in very far north, in the same level than it's the north parts of Alaska. We don't have uh, the permanent, um, what is the Yadik? Glacier. Glacier. So snow is melting every year from, from Finland. It has been after ice age, <laughs> 10,000 years like, like this. So we don't see that kind of uh, clear eviden evidences. But, uh, but uh, normally, in the beginning of January, there is a good skiing and skating climate also in the South Finland. Now it is totally dark and warm. It was also last year. Is it the evidence or, or is it only because this year and last year was different, but who, who knows? But uh, it is in the same line that those evidences which we have got from uh, Greenland, from uh, North Pole, maybe also from South, South Pole. So uh, I don't argue about is the climate change happening. It is, ha there is a change, it is a reality and we have to act. And what are the potential long-term ramifications of climate change in Finland? We have made an analysis and evaluating what, il, what will it mean. Of course, Finnish position is such that actually the, the warmer years, more uh, ra raining, uh, it will actually benefit also us. But uh, we don't think it's a, it's a word of, of that, uh, that change. Um, of course, our coastline is such that if the level of sea will raise, it will harm us a little bit, but uh, mostly in some, mostly in some, some, some cities. Uh, but in our case, we don't, uh, we don't get such uh, uh, impacts like it seems to. We will got in the south, in Mediterranean uh, Europe, when where the Sahara maybe will, 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 will come. So Finland is in that way. We are in quite good position, but uh, but this is a question where we should not think about um, what is happening in just in our home home place. The the impact of climate change it is worldwide, and if the uh, if the uh, the uh, warm will be, for example, four degrees more than uh, average has been the the impact will be dramatic and it will most probably have such um, ser serious consequences also in Finland, also in USA, which we cannot even yet is estimate. One questioner writes, there are some influential people, heads of state such as Václav Klaus, who vehemently disagree with the current assessment of global warming being human caused. Could you please, please give us your views on that? In, inside European Union, we are having in the, in the summits very uh, frank debate, debate and of, of course there are, might be some um, uh, different uh, point of views, but, but uh, the decisions which Union has, have made, we have made with a great unanimity. Uh, 
Last spring, in the Mars summit, uh, we made a, we made a uh, decision that uh, until 2020, we will, we will increase the use of renewables from about 8% to 20% of the total European Union energy. Uh, uh, we, will, we will cut emissions with 20% compared to year 1990. Uh, we, we made a decision that in the 2020, 10% of uh, transport fuels had to be uh, uh, renewables, and we had to uh, uh, increase the energy efficiency with 20%. This last one, it's not so easy to, uh, to, to implement and, and show that we have reached that, but these uh, three first ones, they are very exact uh, dec decisions, and now we have to implement all these. How dependent is Finland on Russian oil and gas imports? And if you could address in more detail any possible concern about Russia's use of oil and gas as political leverage on its neighbors. We are now buying all our raw oil from Russia. But of course, every week we can buy raw oil also from Norway, from UK, from, from Gulf area. So there is no dependence between Russia in that area. Now we are porting also about 80% of our coal from Russia, but of course we can always buy it also from Poland and, and so on. We have ports, we have, Finland is like, almost like an island, we can always use, use uh, uh, ship, ships. And, uh, but the gas, we are dependent, dependent totally. About 10% of our, our uh, total energy uh, consumption comes from natural gas, and we have only pi one pipeline, pipeline from, from Russia. But we have had this situation already more than 30 years, and we haven't had even a day-long uh, problems. It has worked, uh, it has functioned well, and from, in our eyes, Russia has been a very re reliable partner. As I said in my speech, they need our money, we need their gas, and it is business. And, uh, and of course, we are expecting that, uh, uh, that uh, um, energy, uh, energy trade, it is a tr trade, and we will not mix uh, politics to that. And, um, and uh, in, the, in the relations between EU and Russia, uh, of course, the EU's, um, uh, um, EU is trying to get such a strategic uh, partnership between EU and Russia. And uh, as a part of that, the energy trade is in, the, in, in a very important role. I know that um, quite many are afraid that can Russia use energy as a political weapon. But our experience from Finnish uh, history, Finland's history, from the Cold War period, from Soviet time to the, uh, to the modern Russia has been such that we haven't seen a day, even a day, of that, that type of, uh, that type of polit politics. And as, as I said, I think that uh, energy trade should be business and, you, and, and we, sh we should use a normal uh, market rules in that business and uh, not, uh, not to mix with uh, any, any political demands. What is Finland doing now, and what are your plans in terms of diplomatic action in relation to Gazprom's plan to build a pipeline across the Baltic Sea, particularly in relation to plans to survey the seabed? To us, to us this new pipeline, it is totally an um, environmental question. And um, we know that also in the other parts of the world, Companies have built pipelines to the bottom of the bottom of the sea, and and um, of course we are demanding that um, the new pipeline it it can it uh, it cannot uh, make any harm to to environment, and uh, and um, and of course we had to um, uh, to evaluate the evaluate the uh, possible consequences together, and now the company is making its its basic work and. Uh, 
and um, uh, after they have made their evaluation, after that also Finnish uh, administration and also government had to had to make our answer answer to, to that. So to us, this pipeline it's it's um, not any political problem. We realize that um, Central Europe needs more gas from Russia, and we need more pipeline uh, uh, contacts between Russia, Russia and, uh, and Central, Central Europe. But inside European Union, there are also countries who are a little bit worried about what consequences this new pipeline will, will have. But uh, with a good cooperation between all uh, coast states around the Baltic Sea, I, I hope that all these uh, worries, uh, worries can be solved. You addressed the problem of automobile emissions in the United States, but what do you propose to solve the rising problem of pollution and uh, emissions in nations like China and India? Yes, it's, it is, of course, the, it is at least as big problem that is in, in what, what kind of climate policy European Union or United States will, we will have. Um, I know that in both countries in China and India, the cover, governments uh, realize the, the issue uh, very seriously. But uh, what practical uh, um, ways they really have to, 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 um, to answer to the rapidly growing demands of, of en energy and, uh, and um, what role maybe the Western companies and European and uh, North American states could have. I think that our answer will be that we had to develop such a new technologies which can be commer commercialized as quickly as possible also in the conditions which they, ha they, they are having in India and, India and China. Uh, they have a huge potential of wind, electric, wind power, uh, they have um, hydro energy potential. They have a huge potential of uh, renewables, especially bio bioenergy. They had to uh, use more waste materials to produce also uh, energy. And then we had we had also to uh, de develop uh, energy saving technologies, especially to the construction work. Construction and heating systems are, are producing a big part of the total em emissions in the in the world, and and with a better technology we can save save a lot. So, especially in the technological level, we need a lot of such a pra practical cooperation, so then that they can get they can cut, they can get to such a technologies which, which will which will help them. And I see there also. Uh, big possibilities, big challenges to, the, to, to our companies. The green uh, environmental technology, it will be in future a uh, uh, massive, big uh, business, business challenges. And, and uh, we in Finland, we are encouraging our companies really much invest to new technologies because the demand in, ma demand in markets it is growing really rapidly, and uh, and we can get also profitable business possibilities in that in that sector. What are your views on nuclear power as part of the solution to stemming global warming, both in Finland and elsewhere? In, in Finland, we are building a, our fifth nuclear plant. It is total private project. There is not any uh, state subsidize, subsidizes. But in the in a global scale, I don't see it will not be an answer, or it cannot be any on, only, only answer. Last year, um, to the whole world, uh, we got five times as much new wind power than new nuclear plants. So it tells a little bit about the global, global capacity. And, um, and so I'm, I don't see that 
nuclear plants can be a global answer. answer. The answer had to be more saving energy and, and new technologies. Has your government considered uh, subsidizing nuclear power? No, no. Our energy policy is based on market, mark, market based uh, ideas. We think that, um, that um, we have to have a very open uh, energy markets and, um, and it, it is the way how we can um, encourage the companies to develop such uh, uh, technologies which can work profita profitable uh, without any state subsidizes. But then we are willing and ready and we are already using taxation as one uh, mechanism there and, and it might, it, it is maybe a is easier way to, to help people to make choices. What is the right balance between government actions such as tax incentives or public funding and private innovation in fostering clean technologies and re renewable energy? What is the right? Uh, uh, the right balance. Oh, yes, yes. In our R&D policy, uh, we have a, uh, not a written rule, but a rule which what we are using is that when we are making R&D work in fin Finland in Finnish companies, it is normally fin financed so that about two, three, two, three parts comes from private sector and one third comes from uh, public funds. And um, it guarantees that there is, uh, uh, it is uh, enough market-oriented um, uh, research work so that the companies, they know that um, what ideas markets real, really, really need. Uh, the political decision makers can not ever make the decisions that now we had to invest to this and this type of of technology. The companies, the private sector markets had to make these, this type of de de decisions. So this has been the uh, balance in, in Finland and, and Finland is using all about 3.5% of GDP to R&D. We are one of the, we are one, one of the best in the, in the world, B uh, beside Sweden and uh, I, believe, I believe the United States is, States is at the same level. Have you sensed the shift of position on climate change from within the Bush administration? Bush administration has had a different type of point, point of view views in, in climate, climate change. For example, when European Union, we have made a decision that in 2020, 20% uh, of all energy had to be renewables. Uh, Bush administration has made a decision how many, how many million, millions gallons you had to produce uh, uh, renewable fuels in 2020. So it is a different type of, um, different mechanisms. Uh, and, um, and I have seen that Bush administration has more under, underlined the importance to develop new technologies. And, uh, and uh, European Union, we have demand for binding uh, targets, targets and then demand to implement them. I think that we, of course, we need both of these. We had to, we had to uh, decide about binding targets and then we need also technology to implement, to, to, to to achieve these these targets, so I don't see any any such uh, uh, difficulties to mix these two st strategies, and uh, we will have under two years time to make that job before Copenhagen meeting. How do Europeans feel about American efforts on climate change, and can Europe pressure the U.S. to do more? Yes, yes, we are, we are trying to <laughs> push uh, U.S. administration also to be active and, um, and um, to European Union, this is a priority question. And for example, I will, during next two years, uh, all my long distance uh, uh, visits will concentrate 
to this question, climate and energy, energy questions. So we are, we are trying to help uh, international community to make a decision in the Copenhagen meeting in the late 2009. And we are willing to take also pressure from US to European Union. You will be meeting with Bill Gates during your US visit this week. Uh, what are you hoping will come from those talks? I believe we, we, we probably will mostly talk about innovation policy and what the public sector can do in that area in the cooperation with private private sector. But of course, I have met him uh, also before. Of course, I will also try to sell Finland as a, a very good um, investment environment to our, to our new technologies. And, uh, and we think that Finland is one of the best uh, information societies. We have a good basic education among the people. Um, most of Finnish people are using using internet, and I think that also his company they need uh, such a well-functioning laboratories in practical life to produce a new 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 ser services and uh, and and his his company they all already have in Finland uh, uh, quite a lot their work and uh, and we are willing to we are willing to see their activities in Finland more and more. While Finland and the United States are allies, how would you like relations to be different with the next president? We are, we are able and we are willing to uh, cooperate with every president which uh, people of the United States <laughs> have been elect, elected. So, so, so that is the basic principle in the relations between, between, between cont countries. And uh, in my government program, program the uh, transatlantic ties uh, have a very strong role and um, and we have we are we are, we have uh, in many cases we have a very common common position and uh, same goals and especially in um, in uh, trying to develop a modern technology uh, innovation uh, innovation policy these are areas where we I, I think that we really need each others. Even Finland is a very small country with uh, 5.3 million, million population, but in some areas we are in also in a global arena quite, quite strong. We are needing in, in a normal life very many things. We are needing paper and we are needing uh, cell phones. Mm -hmm. in, in both of these I think that uh, Finland is maybe the strongest country in the, in the world. Um, we are not producing these pens and uh, not so much clothes, but uh, it's maybe for the small country it is enough to be strong in some, uh, some areas. How do people in Finland and Europeans in general view the U.S. presidential election? Of course, we are following it very carefully. It is, uh, it, it is uh, in, uh, for our press and uh, for our TV, it's... Um, it's a main question during this this year. Uh, I watched here in the morning TV that there was quite a lot of news about uh, elect, election cam campaign, but there was not no difference to the Finnish TV. <laughs> so, so you can be sure that this is this is um, a campaign which uh, also we are very interesting interest, interested and and also Finnish people they are quite many are thinking that who who. Who will be the who will be the uh, best best and uh, they are selecting their candi candidates. So, so it is a quite strong and big advertisement also to U.S. to have this kind of very open democratic process. We in Finland we have all, always when people are asking also from me that um, who is my fav favorite candidate, I can answer very diplomatic that in Finland we have uh, only one. Uh, word, Han, it means both he and she at the same time. So to me, it's uh, easy to, to say that I hope that Han will win <laughs> without, without uh, giving a, any message about <laughs> is it he or she. Um, how differently do the people of your country perceive the United States today compared to several years ago, say before the Iraq War, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay? It is a, it is a reality that 
all Poles shows that uh, that quite many Finnish people they are a little bit aware about um, U.S. U.S. policy policy and and uh, and quite many are quite critical critical and uh, and uh, there has happened to change during last last de decade, but um, at the same time I, ha I had to say that uh, we also realize the importance um, uh, what we have in the common struggle also against terrorism and uh, against terrorism we had we had to we had to struggle together together but um, but it is true that um, among the people um, uh, maybe in some decades ago the u.s position was uh, maybe more positive than it is it is now nowadays so so the maybe it is maybe the Iraq uh, war. It it has got also quite a lot of, of uh, criticism. What would you recommend to the new U.S. president for uh, fixing this image uh, issue that you raise? I have been also a long time in politics, and uh, everyone outside me, all my uh, supporters and assistants, they are always thinking about what is the image image but <laughs> but um, image is always a result of some of something and uh, and normally the something is such what you had to do and when you have a responsibility you you cannot so much think about image and um, and when you are you, when you have a leadership you had to do what you think you had to do and not so much think about think about image so I'm not going to give any advice to this question. <laughs> okay, we're out of, almost out of time, but before I uh, ask the last question, I have a few last details to take care of here. First of all, if I could uh, remind our members of our upcoming luncheons, which don't seem to be in front of me right now, but I'll try to do them from memory. On Thursday, we have uh, Bill Marriott from Marriott Corporation. Uh, on February 14th, we have Ted Danson joining us. Um, secondly, I can't leave the podium today without mentioning that this will be my last president as National Press Club, my last luncheon as National Press Club president. My term expires on Friday, and I have some very special thank yous that I have to make. Um, I think we've had a very strong luncheon program this year. Our attendance has been up. Uh, we've had four heads of government now here at our program, which is terrific. And I owe so much to the chair of the Speaker's Committee, Angela Gryle and Keene, and our vice chair, uh, Melissa Charbonneau and the entire committee for doing such great work and also my assistant Melinda Cook who puts in extraordinary time putting these luncheons together so thank you all of uh, all of you and I'd like to have a round of applause for all these people who've done such hard work this year. Uh, next we have some traditions here at the National Press Club such as the presentation of our plaque and presuming you do still have some cold winter nights in uh, Finland, you can warm yourself up using the National Press Club mug. <laughs> and finally, uh, there is this question, which is a little different than our earlier questions. As an ex-journalist, what kind of relationship do you enjoy with the Finnish press? <laughs> or do you enjoy it? <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm enjoying it always, <laughs> every, every, every day, but uh, <clears throat> they are very interested about my life, and I'm not in, so much interested about <laughs> their, their <laughs> life, but, yes, but, uh, um, but it, it is normal in, when you have, have this type of uh, leading, leading role. So I'm not anymore a member in, in Finnish press, uh, journalist union. I was a member then, but when I came to politics, I think that it's not a good to be in the uh, both part parties. You have to, <laughs> you have to be in, uh, in the other other party party. And and press has its um, uh, very very um, important role uh, in in controlling political leadership, and it is a. Uh, it is a uh, basic democratic uh, val value, and 
we don't have any democracy if we don't have a, a free and strong pr press. So this is a very, very strong pr 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 principle. And um, now I, I wish to thank the National Press Club for raising this informative, entertaining, and heart, also heartwarming session accompanied by great food and lovely people. And um, I will to give you uh, one book. The name is The Best Kitchen in Town. The, <laughs> this has pro probably written in Helsinki. But, uh, but I, of course, I, I hope that someday you will have here also a menu Finlandia at one of your Rest, restaurants uh, I have enjoyed very much to visit in your in your club and I will also congratulate you as a president hosting the last lunch during during your your term term I don't know when you are when you are leaving some shop is it good to congratulate or not but <laughs> but I, I believe that it is good to congratulate yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you so thank you so much thank you Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I'd also like to mention that today's speech can be found online at www.government.fi. Um, I'd like to thank again Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch. Also thanks to the NPC Library for its research. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by the National Press Club Broadcast Operations Center. Thank you. We're adjourned. Oh, I'm sure. It was a black-white document from some decades ago, and I suddenly found that our former president uh, Urho Kekkonen was speaking in this just same place, and and um, and um, I thought that I, I thought that it's really a privilege to me to to get to got the invitation to here. And let me also thank very much that I got uh, apple pie because uh, <laughs> because. The trip to U US, U.S. is nothing if you don't get at least one so apple pie and <laughs> you give it to me. I also know that you are at this moment of time living a very exciting period here in Washington and the United States in general. Therefore, it gives me all the more ple pleasure that so many people have found the time to come and listen to me. But in fact, what I'm going to tell you, my message from Finland, we Finns find a very important one. Ladies and gentlemen, last year uh, climate change rose very high on the political agenda. This has never before happened for an environmental issue. It is obvious that there is an increasing awareness of the consequences of climate change. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm the president of the National Press Club and Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News. I'd like to welcome our club members and guests who are joining us here today, as well as the audience that's watching on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech and afterwards I will ask as many questions from the audience as time permits. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we can have as much time as possible for questions. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause during the speech, it may be from the guests and members of the general public who attend our luncheons, and not necessarily from the working press. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Paul Marion, Washington Bureau Chief for Crane Communications, Viola Ginger, correspondent for Bloomberg News, Jim Ostroff, Associate Editor at Kiplinger Washington Editors. Esko Hamilo, State Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs. Rick Dunham, Washington Bureau Chief of the Houston Chronicle and a monthly columnist writing last October ranked Finland as the best country to live in. The study said, and I, and I quote, Finland wins high marks for air and water quality, a low incidence of infant disease and how well it protects citizens from water pollution and natural disasters. 
The Prime Minister seeks to follow his own advice to others when it comes to the environment. He lives in a house that he largely built himself, and he likes to walk outdoors, often with people with whom he's discussing the issues of the day. Now, today, thankfully, he's decided to bring such a discussion to our podium. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Finland, Matti Vanhanen, to the National Press Club. Mr. President, thank you so much, distinguished journalists, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege for me to address this audience. It is even more so when I realized that I have been given the honor to be one of the first guest speakers here during the National Press Club's 100th anniversary year. Uh, some weeks ago, I saw from Finnish TV the National Press Club. Instead, he joins us as Prime Minister of Finland. Matti Van Hannen was a journalist on a local newspaper in Finland for six years, including three as editor in chief, until he was elected to parliament in 1991. That started a political career that eventually led to his becoming leader of Finland's center party and prime minister in 2003. And so, Mr. Prime Minister, we welcome you today both as the head of the government of Finland and as someone who is a distinguished alumnus of the journalism profession. As a politician, our guest today has taken a leading role in energy and climate policies, as well as housing issues. He also has frequently spoken about the challenges and opportunities of globalization and underlined the role of entrepreneurship and hard work. The Prime Minister believes strongly in the importance of innovation, specifically in regard to energy matters, as his country seeks to reduce its dependence on oil imports from Russia. We all know, though, that Finland isn't so dependent on imports when it comes to high technology. In fact, just the opposite is true, which reminds me, now would be a good time for all of you to turn off your Nokia cell phones <laughs> so that the speech would not be interrupted. And while its cell phones may be ubiquitous, Finland unfortunately cannot export its quality of life. A Reader's Digest study about American politics and culture for Amulete, Finland's second largest newspaper. <laughs> His Excellency Pekka Lintu, Ambassador of Finland to the United States. Skipping over the podium, Melissa Charbonneau, the Vice Chair of the National Press Club Speaker Committee and White House Correspondent for CBN News. Skipping over our guests for just one moment, Myron Belkine, re retired from Associate, uh, Associated Press and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's luncheon. Alino Kaku, Director General of the Department of, of the Americas and Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Donna Leinwand, National Reporter for USA Today and the Vice President-Elect of the National Press Club. Keith Hill, Writer-Editor for the Bureau of National Affairs and Vice Chair of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Su Suzanne Straglinski, Washington Correspondent for, uh, for the uh, Deseret Morning News of Salt Lake City and Tom Doggett, who covers energy issues for Reuters. <laughs> if our guest of honor had not made a career change 17 years ago, he might well be in the audience today as a working journalist member of the